Hello, Facebook audience. Got a really important show today. Is Russia blackmailing the President of the United States? Got a guest, former Air Force Intelligence Officer Colonel uh, Cedric Layden. It's going to help us answer that question. You won't want to miss this show. It begins in about six minutes. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm going to leave in a second to go grab my guest. So if you see me leave the microphone, that's what it is. If you're watching the archive, just fast, fast forward about five, six, six minutes. And uh, no point in watching me do nothing for six minutes. Yeah, and you know that we don't have phones right now. Yeah. That's okay. My guests and I will have plenty to talk about. All right, I'm going to call him right now. See where he is in traffic. Definitely have the right open this time. <laughs> Sorry about the last, yes, last week. Right there, right there, and we made it. <laughs> yeah, right there. Speaking to that microphone. In fact, we still have time to do a mic check. Hey, you're like two minutes early. Hey, hey. And just so you know, we are recording on Facebook Live now. So anything you say now may be recorded on the internet for all time. Just, just letting you know, we're not on radio yet, but we're on, we're on Facebook Live. All right. So, um, Steve, I want you to check uh, the Colonel's microphone. Make Hi, sure Colonel. Good afternoon. How's he sound? I can't. I'm not getting anything. Have him come out. Nice. Hold right on. up to the mic. Is that better or worse? Uh, have him keep checking. I can't hear anything. Keep talking. Still nothing. Keep trying. Keep talking. Not working? Nope. Not getting anything. All right. Uh, hold on. 
No problem. Take your time. We got talk, three minutes. Talk some more. Testing one, two, there three. There we go. Here yeah. we go. Here we are. Hey. <laughs> now I can hear it even. Hey, How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. How great. are you doing? I'm doing well. Can you? Uh, I'm going to put the. Is he a little hot? Should a I little hot. Yeah, a little bit. All right. Uh, keep just keep talking. Testing General. one, two, I mean, three. Colonel. <laughs> and uh, Colonel, I'm going to put the the program through your headphones. Are you getting the station? You should be hearing talking. Now I am. Yes. Okay. okay good. I just want to make sure that you're getting the station too. So the the telephones actually don't work today. So okay. it's just you and me, which okay. makes well, it easy. Make it work. No, no calls. We'll yeah, you sound you time. sound great. I'm not, I'm not too worried. Thank we you. won't have enough to talk about. I would recommend if you're gonna either uh, laugh or raise your voice to back off the mic. Well, you know so what? Slightly. I can turn him down a bit. I... He he he's good. Where you did you pot him down just now, Mark? I did. Yeah, he's good. Then leave him there. That's good. I'll tell you what. Talk about as loudly as you'll talk. Give me some like exclamation, like I can't believe he did this or whatever. I can't believe it's so bad. All right. Is that is that okay? That's great. It's yeah, picking? it's perfect. Right, totally great. Okay. All right, so we're good. <laughs> Two minutes, um, guys. Thank folks, you. if you're watching on Facebook, um, our phone lines are down today. But what you can do is, if you leave a comment in the uh, Facebook Live and just put your comment there, I can still ask the comment to my guests. To be fair, I probably won't read it till our commercial break. But then I'll take a look at them and I'll be able to pose them to him. So, if you have a comment for me or for Colonel Layton. Uh, just just leave it in the Facebook Live, and, and we can still address you that way. I'm sorry our lines are down. Um, blame Verizon. No one heard that, right? Uh, hey, you know, if it is, if it's true, it's true. Um, anyway, we'll be on in uh, beginning in 60 seconds. Uh, oh, and for, for my Facebook Live audience, this is Colonel Cedric Layton. He's going to yes. wave at you. You won't be able to see him during the broadcast because uh, I haven't figured out how to make this two cameras yet but i do want to show you i do have a live guest in studio i'm not just you know making voices or something so <laughs> uh told that my voice is very low roy writes my very my voice is very faint it sounds great on my program on my have you feed checked on your facebook have you checked i facebook? can't right now because i'm playing audio from the same pot so when we get on, I'll try right, to check it. I'll tell you it. what, sometimes, I mean, I can increase, I don't want to over-modulate there. Yeah, yeah, you sound really good right now, for to me, yeah, anyway. I'm just, um, I'm sorry my voice is so faint on Facebook, folks. If you'll increase your volume, I hesitate to touch it here, because I'm afraid I will peak. Um, You've been listening to Top of the Hour. Ten seconds, we're coming back. Channel on tune in. Hope, hope we can hear, folks. interviews and exclusive progressive news and information at the top of the hour. Live from our nation's capital, it's the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Let me know when you're ready, Mark. I'm ready. You are up, sir. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. At, uh, I guess, just day four of a very, very strange week in American history. We've seen the President of the United States stand next to the dictator of Russia. That's right, uh, the successor to the evil empire, as Ronald Reagan used to call it, and saying that um, he doesn't believe the 17 or so U.S. intelligence agencies that said that Russia interfered in our election because Vladimir Putin gave him a strong denial. And uh, I guess our president just takes Putin's word for it. Uh, later on, we said there, well, I don't know why it would be Russia um, before his staff kind of pinned him down and forced him to say, no, no, I mean, I don't know why it wouldn't be Russia. But even in his red correction he said it could be somebody else now that's weird stuff that's not usual even in donald trump land that's not usual to have a president of the united states basically throw america under the bus and defend the dictator of russia it's not that common folks and it's led a number of us to ask the question is something going on here do the Russians have something on Donald Trump? To help discuss this issue, and really the old Soviet practice, current Russian practice of something called kompromat, K-O-M-P-R-O-M-A-T. It, it kind of is like what it sounds in English, compromising information, information used to blackmail someone. This is something that the Russian secret police, the, that the KGB 
have done for, well, decades, if not centuries. And I have a really terrific guest in studio to chat with us about it. His name is Colonel Cedric Layton. He's the founder and president of Cedric Layton Associates, a strategic risk and leadership consultancy serving global companies and service organizations. But what you really need to know is that he served in US, the US Air Force for 26 years as an intelligence officer, attaining the rank of Colonel. And he's been all over the world and he's a bit of an expert in how the Russians act. And so Colonel Layton, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hey Mark, it's great to be with you. Let me start, before we even get to the present day, I think it's important for people to understand that the Soviet Union and now Russia spying on people, trying to find compromising information on people. This is not some new, crazy, out of the wall concept. This is kind of standard Soviet and now Russia practice. Is that right? Absolutely. And it goes back even before the Soviet Union. The Tsars had a secret service called the Okhrana, and the Okhrana was known to be very active against dissidents, Russian dissidents at the time, people like Lenin and uh, Trotsky and people like that. But you, when you went to, uh, when you got to past the Russian Revolution and uh, the Russian Civil War, uh, you had some really mean types that uh, populated the uh, Soviet secret police at the time. We're talking the OGPU, which then became the NKVD, which then eventually became the KGB. And everybody knows the KGB, at least by its initials. Uh, those guys uh, practiced a lot of different things. And one of the biggest things that they did uh, was, especially in the wake of World War II, they compromised a whole bunch of Eastern European leaders. When World War II ended, um, the Eastern European countries, countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia at the time, Hungary, uh, you, know, you name it, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, all of them had a chance at some degree of freedom, some degree of democracy. The problem was, was that the communists, and in this case, the Soviet communists, controlled the levers of power, and they made sure that they controlled such things as the interior ministry, which in those countries meant the, the secret police. They controlled the secret police, the uniformed police, and they developed a whole series of techniques, a whole series of tactics uh, that involved getting into not only what their opposition was doing, but they wanted to go in and actually change what the opposition was up to. They wanted to find compromising information on their opposition leaders. Uh, there were people like uh, Imre Nodz in Hungary, uh, who uh, was basically compromised as the Hungarian prime minister and was ended up being executed in, in a show trial. That's the kind I, of I know that, that for example, at one time, East Germany, back when East Germany was a country, I believe had files on some 10% of its citizens. It had its own secret police styled after the Russian secret, right. secret police. Right, Mark, and that was the Stasi, uh, the, the right. state security service. And the Stasi was very uh, impressive in their thoroughness. And, uh, and they would have just people spying, just, you could be in your local, um, you know, uh, I don't know, bowling club, I don't know what they're in Russia, <laughs> but, but local sporting, sporting sure. club, or your local knitting club, or your local book club, and they would have an agent way down at the micro granular level of some small town watching to see neighbors literally spying on neighbors. Oh, absolutely. And you know what you could find out even to this day, uh, German citizens, East, now East, or formerly East German citizens, can go to the uh, files that the Stasi has on them and can see some people have chosen not to do that because they didn't want to compromise the friendships and relationships that they currently have. But uh, you're right, they went to a very granular level. In essence, what they did was they copied the organization of the Communist Party uh, down to the cellular level. And uh, then they made it even more intrusive than the, what the Communist Party itself would do. And that was really what uh, created this massive system that allowed for the informing on all of the people. And this surveillance occurred even before the cameras were readily accessed and hidden and just, just basically people spying on people and, and doing files on them. Um, so we fast forward now to the beginning of Vladimir Putin. Putin is a former KGB agent, uh, more than that, intelligence officer, kind of, I guess, what you did on the other side. I don't know, maybe he, he, he got to a higher rank. Well, he could, yeah, I, I would say the president of Russia is probably a higher rank. No, but I mean, but, when he, but he was an intelligence officer. Maybe tell me this, and I, obviously there's only some things you can tell me, but give me an idea of what you did for 26 years as an intelligence officer. I know you're not going to share anything top secret, but just the nature of what you did and how that may be the same or different than what Putin was doing in the KGB 20 years ago. 
So basically, Putin was uh, headquartered in, in a, an East German city known as Dresden. And at the same time that Putin was in Dresden, I was in West Berlin. So we weren't that far no, apart no. in terms of geography. Right, right, uh, so, but uh, our jobs were different. Uh, he was at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was a captain in the U.S. Air Force, and our job was on uh, the signals intelligence side of things. Uh, so the signals intelligence piece uh, was basically a uh, getting intercept of communications. Uh, we focused a lot on the air traffic that was going in and out of Eastern Germany. And uh, there were other things that we did, of course, but that was the primary mission that we had. So you were kind of both spying on East Germans. Of both course. you and Putin, ironically, Absolutely. were both spying on the same people. And he was spying on us too. But but you were spying on these Germans to find out what they were doing. And he was spying on his own people and in East Germany. And then one of the things I found interesting, there's there's um they talked about that really small period of time when Russia was kind of a democracy. I mean, under Boris Yeltsin, it was maybe a proto-democracy. It was on its way. Right. They did have fair elections for a time, they did have free press for a time. And uh, there was a, a prosecutor who was talking about corruption in the Russian government. Um, and there's tons of corruption in the Russian government, and the Russian government did not want people to know about the corruption. And Putin very famously found pictures or video, or fr frankly, the guy denies it was him, so it may have been a guy that looked like him, but video of an elderly man in bed with a mistress uh, that he managed somehow to broadcast on national TV and bring down this prosecutor. Did you know the story? Oh, yes, absolutely. And that is a classic case of compromat, uh, of compromising information. What you're dealing with here is somebody, uh, in, you know, Putin became the head of the FSB, which was a successor organization to the KGB. Uh, and as a KGB officer, of course, he practiced the arts of compromat uh, while he was stationed in East Germany and probably before that time as well. Uh, you know, in our case, we didn't do any of that kind of stuff. We were just solely there as information gatherers. But they, the Russians have the tendency not to just gather information. They also want to influence information. They want to influence people. And Kompromat, in the case of that prosecutor that you're talking about, it destroyed the guy's career and his life. And that it's, it's interesting that there's a word. We don't even have a word in English. We got blackmail, which is kind of different. Kompromat is, is a word in Russian. K-O-M-P-R-O-M-A-T. I guess we spell it in English. Right. Again, we don't even have a word for it. How would you define compromat? So compromat is basically going after somebody and finding as much compromising information as you can about that person, preferably catching them in the act of something bad, such as a sexual encounter, uh, such as you know maybe buying drugs illicitly. Uh, you know, could it be financial money laundering? It could absolutely. be anything. Absolutely, it could be anything. And so all of that information—it's not just the, you know the sex lies and videotape piece of it, which is important. Uh, but there's also the aspect of financial information. There's also perhaps, uh, you know, if let's say somebody fabricated their transcripts from the university, uh, you know, if you if they say that, hey, wait a second, you didn't, or it could even be maybe they graduated legitimately, but if they raise questions about their credentials. I was just going to say, um, in this case, in the prosecutor's case, whose name escapes me at the moment, as I recall, to the day he died, he denied he was in that tape. In other words, even if a guy is pure as the driven snow, he's never done drugs, he's always paid his taxes, he's never cheated on his wife, that doesn't mean you can't do compromise on that person, right? Because oh, you just make something up. That's right. And you know, this is the whole piece that's very important in this time when we talk about fake news. Yeah. Uh, because it's you know, we're really dealing with fake information that seems real. And the whole idea of compromat is, you know, you find either legitimately bad information on somebody or you make it up. And if you can make that information up, it's just as damaging as the truth it, because it seems as if it is the truth. And if you believe the source of that story, then you're going to be more likely to believe the false news that is uh, false information that is implanted in that whole storyline. And the best kinds of storylines in this case are the ones that actually take what are real pieces of information, mix them with falsehoods, and then you come out with a blended whole, and that blended whole serves your strategic interests. You have to look at it in, in the sense that this is not just doing it for the sake, doing compromat for the sake of doing compromat. What we're talking about here is a strategy that is designed to weaken opponents. 
Uh, Russians think at least five moves, moves ahead, just like you do in chess, especially Russian intelligence agents. And what they're going to do is they're going to find a person. They're going to find a target. And anybody could be that target. But what they do is they go in and they figure out, okay, these are the things where that person is vulnerable. And those can either be physical vulnerabilities it or psychological. It could be a man who uh, really likes beautiful women. And if a couple prostitutes knock on his door at, say, the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow uh, at midnight after he's celebrated say a Miss Universe pageant, uh, he might, they might think he's the kind of person who would allow beautiful women in his room because that's a guy who's done that in the past. Absolutely. And um, they might just have some cameras installed in, in the Ritz-Carlton. Well, it, almost, almost every room in the old Soviet Union, as well as in the new Russia, especially at the high, high level, at the higher end hotels and in the higher end rooms, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that they have cameras and listening devices in them. It's interesting, Vladimir Putin in Helsinki did not deny that he had compromise on Donald Trump. He just said, me? Do you say? I didn't even know he was there. By the way, we now we know that he knows he was there. But I didn't even know he was there. Do you think we kept tabs on 500 people? You know, we know that 30 years ago in the Stasi, they kept tabs on more than 10 million people. Absolutely. 500 is not a very... Uh, hefty number. We got to take a break, folks. If you want to uh, leave a comment, come to Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Mark Levine Talk, or go to marklevinetalk.com. I'll uh, read your comments uh, on the air, and we'll be right back right after this. So hey right it's now, Rebecca just Dallas so you know, Colonel Late, let's let's, turn, let's kill the feet. Yeah, so only the Facebook audience can hear this little in-between right, stuff. Right, right, sure. Because uh, sure. I, don't, I don't turn it off and on again. The radio audience can't, but mm -hmm. I'm seeing what people wrote. <laughs> um, and um, strange how many Republicans support how Trump handled the summit with Putin, someone writes. Yeah. I think and, and Roy is still having a hard time hearing. Um do you want to try, Steve, to see if I can increase my feed without without damaging anything to the Facebook crew? Or you think it's it's kind of dangerous to do that? You, Steve, you there? Oh, it's good for Mark. So Diana here is okay. Roy does not. I don't know what to tell you, Roy. Uh, one of the things you can do, Roy, um, and I don't think you've been on here before that I can recall, is um, in addition – oh, sound is good. So I think it's – with all due respect, it may just be you, Roy. Here's what I want you to do. Um, check the sound on your computer all the way up. Also check that the sound on the Facebook page is all the way up. It often has a separate volume switch, and I find sometimes that helps for me for Facebook Live. But everyone else is telling me it's good, so um, I'm, I'm afraid I don't dare touch it. You don't want me so loud that it's distorted. So hang in there, Roy. One more thing, Roy. If you're having real trouble, if you go to marklevingtalk.com, you can't see me on our, our beautiful faces, but you'll be able to hear Colonel Layton and me uh, at marklevingtalk.com, and uh, no one ever has trouble with the sound there. Facebook Live, I do sometimes get these complaints. So um, um, check that out, Roy. Other than the sound complaint, all I'm getting is, and, and I'll ask this question. We're, we're going we're gonna to go through the whole story here, mm -hmm. but I'll ask Colonel Layton at the end the question of the person of why Republicans are defending this. It's, it's a fair question. I just think we're not at that. That's kind of the end of the story question, not at the beginning one. But folks, if you have other questions, feel free to post them. We'll be back in about a minute or two. Oh, that's true, Roy. Yeah, listen on Mark Levine Talk and watch on Facebook Live. Yeah, that works for you. Hopefully, usually we never have sound trouble at marklevingtalk.com. So, yeah, please check that out. That's always hard when, you, when you're trying to you know, listen through, through right. something like this. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, and, and 
Well, if several people have complaints about oh, sound, yeah, then, then it's coming check. from our end. But right Absolutely. now it's one person, so I think, right. I think it's – Right, okay. yeah, so hopefully we will be able to – Right. And people are liking when I turn the camera to you when you talk, so I'll, I'll do a little more Okay, sure. Yeah, cool. <laughs> it's great. Well, it's great to, great to have a good audience like that. You know. Yeah. So um, the Facebook Live audience is relatively small, but we're in 42 markets coast to coast. That's we great. are wow. um, Progressive Voices uh, mm -hmm. and Podcast mm -hmm. and um, um, iHeartRadio and mm -hmm. uh, people get it on iTunes. But those are all archived. Uh, the mm -hmm. only thing live is the radio and Progressive Voices. Progressive Voices. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's uh Oh, super. That's that's great to reach out like that and to, you know, thanks to have for that. Com yeah. Thanks for coming in. Oh, I'll tell you, pleasure. when our phone yeah. system was down, I got really nervous. But, yeah. but you're, uh, <laughs> Ten seconds, guys. All coming right. back. Okay. Thank you. The dual shot looks really good. Okay. I don't think you can get both of us in. Let's see. Yep. Nah, not quite. I think we have to do one or the other. But I'll get him when he's talking. And here's our favorite line. Let me know when you're ready. Ready. You're up. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. We've been studying the dark art of blackmail, specifically blackmail that the KGB and uh, its successor, the FSB in Russia, have done for, well, apparently more than 100 years, even predating the Soviet Union. It's called kompromat. It is a specific Russian word for obtaining compromising material about it could be a political opponent, it could be a foreign opponent, it could be anyone that the government of Russia wants to take down, they, it could, doesn't even have to be true, but they find the information and they use it against an opponent. So my guest is Colonel Cedric Layton. He has been with the former intelligence officer with the U.S. Air Force for some 26 years. Uh, and Colonel Layton, we've set the stage for what Compromat is about. I want to go now to, I guess it was 2013. We have businessman Donald Trump, um, you know, bragging about his wealth, whatever it is. It's, 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 it, he has some wealth. Uh, he's running the Miss Universe pageant in Moscow. He's staying at the single most expensive hotel in Moscow in the presidential suite. So the most expensive room of the most expensive hotel that looks out over Red Square. Um, is he being filmed? Of course, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that the Russians are going to do is they're going to find out who the most prominent people are that are going to big events. They love big events. You know, Russia just hosted the World Cup. Uh, you know, it was a huge success uh, before that. Of course, in the sporting world, you had the Winter Olympics. Uh, all of those things are very important to Vladimir Putin. And, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin was president of Russia or was in power in Russia at that time. And that key fact uh, also shows that the intelligence agencies were being leaned on uh, to look for interesting people, possible targets, people that they could, you know, either turn or use or get information. Now Putin on. says, "Well, but Donald Trump wasn't running for president at that time. I, I didn't care. I didn't watch him. Uh, we're not to take him." In his word there. Well, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin has an encyclopedic memory, and one of the things that he does is he figures out uh, who the most important people are that are, uh, uh, you know, either visiting Russia or that come into, uh, you know, somehow into the Russian orbit, and he pays attention to them. Now, why, why would he have a businessman as distinct from a politician? Why would he film that? Well, one possibility is that, you know, if he ever needs to leverage what that uh, what that businessman is doing for whatever purpose, uh, he can find uh, ways to do that if he has compromising material on that business. So person. he could help maybe a Russian business succeed against an American business or potentially it, it doesn't yeah. always have to be political. No, because there's no, and we have to keep in mind in Russia, there is no distinction between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, at least when they say the Russian oligarchs, they really mean Putin's guys. Absolutely. You wouldn't be a Russian oligarch if you weren't one of Putin's guys. And in fact, if you think about it, the people that uh, opposed Putin, the oligarchs, uh, you know, prior to Putin assuming the presidency, who opposed Putin, uh, they're gone. They're either dead or in exile. Or you know something has happened, or, or something weird has happened. Like suddenly they've been poisoned, or suddenly they've been murdered, or absolutely suddenly. Um, now it's interesting because Putin really didn't have this absolute power ten years ago. Um, in fact, uh, there was arguably a real Russian election back when President Obama was president, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, and um, the people actually rose up because they were stuffing the ballot box. They rose up in the streets. And Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama defended the people of Russia's right to choose their own leaders. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Vladimir Putin appear, apparently didn't like that very much. No, he didn't. And that was one of the prime reasons why he uh, was so opposed to Hillary Clinton possibly becoming the president of the United States. Uh, he found that to be, in essence, crossing the line, his line of, you know, what is permissible interference in another in another country's affairs, in this case his own. His to be own. clear, we didn't pretend to be Russians and put out propaganda the way oh, they no. did for America. No. We simply said that people have a right to choose their own leader, and we called out really ballot stuffing is what happened. Absolutely, and there's video of the ballot stuffing going on. Uh, you know, you can find uh, Russians uh, looking in the different uh, areas and finding uh, different ballot boxes and saying, hey, wait a second. Uh, there are more votes here than there are people who voted in this particular, you know, in this particular region. We got to take one more break, uh, folks. If you want to leave a comment, please leave it on Facebook at MarkLevingTalk.com. We have a long segment coming up, trying to figure out what's controlling Donald Trump. We'll be right back right after this. My name is Mira Batra. I have been so in this country um, 32 years, and this piece, is please. how I live united. America has always been the land of promise, and in my okay, uh, so that's kind of how we're doing. Long segment, short segment. Yeah, that's, that's short, neat. Short yeah, so you go from back back and yeah. forth that way. Um, that's good. That's yeah. how we do it. Um, yeah. And um, I mean, in terms of where I want to go, I've I've kind of already set the stage now. Mm -hmm. So now I kind of want to move to the present day. Okay. Talk mm -hmm. about what happened in Helsinki. What you think happened? Mm -hmm. What you sure. think? You know about how unusual it is, and and. We've set the stage for compromise, and I'm just going to ask you directly, do you mm -hmm. think oh, yeah. that, yeah. that he mm -hmm. is being compromised, and what do you think it is, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and why do you think so based on your experience as an intelligence officer? Sure, absolutely. I, I don't yeah. know that you need experience as an intelligence officer. <laughs> to me, it, 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 to, to the layman, it seems, yeah, like a hostage situation. Uh, but well, that's, um, that's not far from the truth. You know, I, I mean, yeah. when someone says, oh, um, I'm fine, and he's a really good Good, good, good guy, guy. <laughs> and um, he's strong and powerful, and I um, really, really like him. I, I, he had a really great proposal. Oh, and thank you for the soccer ball, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've seen people in North Korea with, um, 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 you know, more independence it seems than our president. Yeah, which but is you know, we joke about it, but yeah, then yeah. get to the seriousness of sure. what it really means for our country. And yeah. and I don't know. I'm gonna ask you. Um, I don't know if you have any historical example. I don't know that I can't think of one I, of an American president yeah. being in this position. I really can't no. think of one. I can um, think of you know we've had intelligence officers. Oh, absolutely. Walter Gaines. You know, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, but, absolutely. But but I can't think of anyone this yeah. high up. I mean, yeah. Aaron Burr was tried for treason right. in 1804. Uh, so you know, with Aaron Burr, and I actually knew one of his descendants. He uh, one of his descendants. Direct descendant went to uh, school with me, uh, you know, back in the day. But um, the plotting with, I think, Mexico, Mexico. to take some land. Yes. Um, but he was yes. acquitted. Actually. He was acquitted. That's right. So you so know, I don't very, know. I, I, a, I wasn't was. there when it happened. I, I, I wasn't in the room where it happened. To quote Hamilton, so I, I don't know whether Burr was guilty or not. But I would say the evidence against Trump is a bit more than the evidence against Burr. Uh, yeah, I, I think and, so. And, and that's and that's something that's you know that's very troubling. I think to a lot of uh, national security professionals when you look at that. They're uh, you know, there, there's so many ways that this could go, but yeah, I'll be happy to, yeah. to discuss right, that. Yeah, all right, so just yeah. so you know what's coming up. Yeah, definitely. No, Let's see what, what the comments are. Sure. They asked that the colonel speak a little closer to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> colonel can do that. Uh, I'm reading what else we got here. Okay. Questions about where Trump's money came from. That's a very That's good a great question. question. Yeah, I think yeah. we should talk let's, about let's that. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, all right. We'll be back shortly. I'm still getting used to the video part of it. I've done That's radio for yeah. 15 years, but uh, the video only for about a year and Facebook Live. But it's funny. I. I put it on my website. No one watched it. So, but Facebook Live, everybody, everybody watches, watches it. it. It's it's interesting. Yeah, Facebook hand, it tends to. I, mean, I guess they, the audience has gotten older uh, on yeah. Facebook than when it originally started. But right. uh, boy, there's a there's people a don't very, go to websites anymore. So, no, it's uh, all my, social media. I know. I, know. Type so, or so yeah. I, I went where the platform was, but this yeah, platform unfortunately fun. is not as easy to handle. Actually, as the one that was on my website. So yeah, yeah. It is, it is what it is. Yeah, that's that's. I guess it does. You know, make 
people in this business, you know, have to be a little bit more agile than they otherwise would be. Yeah, but I no, that's great. Best. I think it's awesome. I think it's an awesome show. And, uh, you know, you've got a, a great... Hey, we're coming back, guys. All right, we're good. Next week. The Lori Flanders Show is a TV and radio program that seeks to raise radical spirits by interviewing forward-thinking people with real experiences of shifting power from the few to the many in the worlds of economics, arts, and politics. Join us. And now, the voice of reason in an unreasonable world. Let me know when you're ready, buddy. Mark Levine. You are up, sir. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. In the first half hour, we discussed with my guest, Colonel Cedric Layton, who is a former Air Force intelligence officer for more than 26 years, formerly stationed in West Berlin, not too far away from, well, uh, KGB intelligence officer Vladimir Putin. You may have heard of him. Um, and um, we talked about the Soviet and Russian and pre- and post-Soviet practice of compromat, the way uh, basically Russians blackmail, the Russian government uses compromising information to blackmail people to do what they want. So now we fast forward right to the present day, or at least to this week, where we see a United States president who never had anything bad to say about Vladimir Putin. Even during when he was running for office, nothing bad to say about Vladimir Putin I can't recall a single Democrat or Republican mainstream candidate. I guess there's some fringe candidates, but a mainstream candidate for president of the United States who would not criticize the, I guess, dictator of our most powerful adversary. Um, and that was weird in it, it, as it went. Uh, we know now that uh, they were doing an investigation into him in 2016. We, Hillary Clinton said he was Putin's puppet. A lot of times people scratched their heads. They didn't believe her, I guess. Um, but now in Helsinki, now after demanding to spend two and a half hours alone with the guy, just with him and the translator, we still don't know what they talked about. And after his press conference performance and then the verbal gymnastics that he's gone through, I mean, the question arises, what, what's going on? What do you, with your experience, 26 years in intelligence, what do you really think is going on with Donald Trump? So, you know, the, uh, Mark, the whole hallmarks of everything that you talked about uh, are very troubling to any intelligence professional. You know, you look at the kinds of things that, uh, you know, with the, the way in which he's praised Putin, the way, and this is before he even ever met him, supposedly. Um, it, it does bear the hallmarks of somebody who is being influenced, at the very least being influenced by uh, the other person. So the other person in this case, of course, being Putin. Can you give me an example of, uh, you don't have to give me names, but another example of someone who had been compromised, maybe an American or something like that. And how does a victim of blackmail, a victim of compromise, how do they act? What are the telltale signs? So in in normal people's cases, you know, let's take the case of Aldrich Ames, who was a CIA agent uh, and very famously basically considered uh, perhaps the biggest Russian or Soviet It's like a mold. double agent. Basically. Double agent, yeah. So in a case like that, you know, where you've got a double agent of that type, uh, you you know you you the Russians find found a vulnerability in him, and the way what that, was the vulnerability? The was vulnerability it? was money, and okay. and the fact that he wasn't being promoted. So obviously that's not the problem that Donald Trump has. Donald Trump has you know the idea there's there's an ego there. Obviously there is uh, the need uh, to basically maintain and hold power, whether it's economic power. Uh, business power or political power. So in it's this interesting. Case. Him, like Aldrich Ames, is this feeling of I'm not being recognized for the – I'm a really important person and I'm not being recognized for it. And that kind of anger of someone who feels that they should get more than – that they deserve more maybe than they've gotten – Right. Actually, that might be a common way to, to get someone. Absolutely. And, you know, that's that's what intelligence agencies, That's the, those are the kinds of people that intelligence agencies target. Uh, so what they're looking for is vulnerabilities in that way. You know, if somebody has, uh, let's say, an ill parent and they've got a really high medical bills and their financial uh, a system, their financial finances are in disarray, uh, that can be a, a telltale sign. So, so what does the victim do? What, what, what is the black – if you're a victim of blackmail – and obviously you don't want to be exposed, what are the signs of someone who's not speaking just, hey, I have an opinion, a rush is fine by me, someone who's, who's actually being compromised? What do you look for, nonverbal so, cues? Th sometimes you look for nonverbal cues. So in the case of a political leader, you know, somebody who has actually, uh, you know, well, you can take uh, the case of some German politicians in the Cold War period. Some of them were compromised by the KGB. And the way a lot of those people acted uh, was that they would always say great things about the Soviet Union. You know, so 
they be members of parliament? There were several that were in that category. And what they would end up doing was, you know, you'd always hear of them talking about Germany leaving NATO, or in this case, West Germany leaving NATO. And that, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing. So, you know, fast forward to today, and what is President Trump talking about? He's talking about, uh, in essence, weakening the NATO alliance. You know, the question in the interview with CBS where he said, hey, um, you know, why should uh, my son uh, go fight for Montenegro? Well, the reason he would go fight for Montenegro is because Montenegro is fighting for us in Afghanistan right now. Well, They're- not just that, but, you know, whether it's Montenegro or Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Absolutely. you know, once, once the Russians see that we're not going to defend one nation, well, the whole, the whole concept of NATO falls apart because right. will we defend Poland? Will we defend Hungary? Will we defend Germany? I mean, where does it stop? Absolutely. Where would it stop? And there, that's a kind of an odd uh, you know, extrapolation of the so far discredited domino theory. But in this case, the domino theory would actually work. Because it's a treaty. It's we, a treaty. We, we, that's we, right. Well, let me, let me ask you this, and I don't want to get too far off topic, but we did have a treaty with Ukraine. Uh, it wasn't a NATO treaty. They weren't part of NATO. But we, the Soviet Union, I guess it was, a, no, it was Russia then. We, Russia, uh, the UK, um, and Ukraine signed a deal. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, and we promised to protect the territorial integrity of Ukraine, which included Crimea and, and so forth. Um, right. does, does Russia feel more emboldened because they were able to basically violate that treaty and take parts of Ukraine? Absolutely, because what the, you know, when you look at the Russian situation, they're taking eastern Ukraine because they say, uh, that there are more Russian-speaking and ethnic Russian people in eastern Ukraine than there are Ukrainian people. Uh, and to some extent, in some regions, that's actually true. In Crimea, it's also the case that there are more ethnic Russians. It's also than... true in the Sudetenland when Hitler took exactly. part of uh, the Czechoslovakia. And that's exactly where I was going with that. It is precisely analogous, and it's very rare to have precise historical analogies, but in this case, it's precisely analogous to what happened in the late 1930s with the Sudetenland. Uh, because when uh, the Western powers, Great Britain and France in particular, agreed to let Hitler take the Sudetenland, that spelled the death knell of Czechoslovakia, even though the majority of the population in the Sudetenland was German-speaking and and would have wanted to join the Third Reich. But uh, the problem with all of this is that once you violate the territorial integrity of a country, there is no stopping you. And the person who has violated that initial part, the so-called, you know, perhaps somewhat legitimate part of it, they won't stop. He will want to go. He, so, Putin, will want to go. So here. how do you as an intelligence officer distinguish between someone who has a view that you and I both think is wrong? You know, let Russia take uh, the Crimea. OK, I don't support that. You don't support that. But surely there's some American who we disagree with, who supports that, but isn't being blackmailed by Vladimir Putin. How can you tell someone who has a legitimate policy, pro-Russia, maybe even belief, and someone who's under the thumb of the KGB? Can, can you make that distinction? So it's, it's basically an art form. There's a science to it and there's an art to it. But when you look at you know the types of forensics that you would go through as an intelligence agent and uh, try to determine, okay, who's being compromised here and who's just expressing political views, uh, you look at where they sit in the power structure. Uh, you also look at you know what kinds of relationships they have. If the person who is spouting views and only spouting views, uh, you know, most likely they won't have relationships with people, or at least extensive relationships with people in a place like Russia. But in the case of Donald Trump, there are extensive relationships with Russia, extensive financial. Mueller has cited eighty-two people so far. Trump has denied any contact with Russia, and the eighty-two people include family members, campaign people, people in government. Um, you said with Aldrich, Aldrich Ames, you know, that had to do with money. Is it possible that Donald Trump has to do with money, too? I, I've heard that only Deutsche Bank would take his loans because American banks kind of learned he doesn't pay his loans back. And right. Deutsche Bank was connected with Russia in some way. Could all of this be totally apart from the salacious tape of prostitutes in, in Moscow, which may well exist? Frankly, I, I'm inclined to think it does. But totally apart from that. Could there be a money thing? And that's why Donald Trump, for example, won't disclose his tax returns. Absolutely. And here's why I say that. Uh, Donald Trump sold a major property in Florida to a Russian oligarch for well over market price. I think he got like $330 million for it. Uh, and it was worth about a third of that, supposedly, according to the real estate uh, experts at that time. And the issue there is that the way Russian oligarchs uh, take care of money and launder their money is through real estate transactions. The primary areas where they engage in those real estate uh, transactions are in the United States, particularly in Florida. 
and in New York City as well, and in the UK. Uh, they also do some work like that in France, a little bit in the Middle East, uh, but it's much more lucrative to do it in Europe and in the United States than it is to do so, it in so Russia. So this is before Donald Trump ran for office. Right. Tell me what would be the motivation of Putin and the oligarchs under his power to give hundreds of millions of dollars to this businessman? Why, why would they do it? So in some cases, it's buying influence. In some cases, it's actually going in and saying, uh, uh, okay, we think that this person has a degree of influence. So we have to remember that Donald Trump was a reality TV star before he became president. And anybody who has influence is somebody that you want on their side. Take it, you know, going back to the 1930s, another analogy is Charles Lindbergh in Nazi Germany. Uh, you see how Lindbergh... Interesting. Yeah, he wasn't a politician either, but he right. had tremendous influence over popular culture. Absolutely. Tremendous influence over popular culture, an American hero. Uh, and he loved the fact that, you know, to use that overused phrase, he loved the fact that in Germany the trains ran on, ran on time. And that very fact... He's actually the author of the first America First movement. That's correct. And, you know, so when you look at that, uh, you know, you, you see the roots of all of these different things. The parallels are striking. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's an exact replay of history, but it's certainly something where history can inform us. And when you see, you know, uh, American isolationism, you look at all the different aspects of the Make America Great Again campaign that the uh, Trump organization ran, uh, and you look at the data analytics piece of everything, a lot of that could not have been homegrown. And the reason I say it could not have been homegrown is because it was so sophisticated. Uh, what, what was sophisticated? I know 17 intelligence agencies, they've all come down. They said it's a sure thing. Everyone I've talked to in Congress, uh, uh, you know, the bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee said it, said it happened. Uh, how do we know that there are Russian fingerprints on what, you know, the Facebook and social media and other meddling in, in 2016? Just, Why, what, I mean, Donald Trump says he could be a 400-pound guy in his basement. Well, a 400-pound guy could be very well be a Russian well, who that's, works that's for true, the actually. FSB. Fair, fair so, so, you know, we're putting the 400-pound guy aside for a second. The way in which uh, you determine that is through forensics. And uh, so there's several aspects of this. You know, a lot of people look at this as the hack of the election or the, you know, a cyber attack. That was a component to this. But this is far greater than just a, uh, a cyber attack. This is an influence operation designed to take every single element of power that is at the disposal of the Russian state that they can use without revealing too much that they're behind this. Every single influence, uh, instrument of power that they can use to influence things in America was deployed in the service of their effort to influence the 2016 election. And again, they, they did this in Ukraine before they took over. They, right. they tried in France, didn't right. succeed so much. They've tried in Germany, Hungary, I think. Hungary, um, yes, yeah, with uh, may, may have Orban. succeeded. They have succeeded uh, up to this point because Orban is basically, the Prime Minister of Hungary is basically in the, in the pocket of Putin. And they use pre-existing fault lines. So they look at racism as a pre-existing fault line in America, this right-left debate. It's interesting because we have this old notion of communism as the far left. Really, Putin is kind of the hero of the far right, right? I mean, neo-Nazis love Vladimir Putin. Absolutely. Even and if Hitler did not love the Soviet Union. Absolutely. And, you know, that's the irony of everything, because a lot of the things that Putin has borrowed uh, for his political... Anti-immigrant, for example. And absolutely. Rhetoric. The anti-immigrant idea, the old anti-immigrant rhetoric, which is playing a big role in Hungary's you know, way of doing things right now and, and their political climate. Uh, that is a huge factor because, the you know, in Russia, that plays extremely well because uh, Russia has demographic challenges and they don't, a lot of people in Russia do not want influences from outside. It's a very insular culture in many respects. Uh, here in the United States, there of course are elements like that as well. And they don't want their economic position to be challenged by people from other places, whether it's Mexico or India or China. It, it almost doesn't matter whether they're physically here or whether they're just making stuff that we that we then import. Uh, those people present a threat to a, a natural constituency for Donald Trump. And so you put all of this together. And when Donald Trump decided to run for president, I uh, you know, there are two, two possibilities here in my mind, at least two possibilities. One is that uh, the Russians said, hey, why don't you try this? And remember, Trump had mused about running for president as far back as the 1980s. Uh, the Russians knew this. They do a lot of he research. He talked about in 2012. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, it was more serious, obviously, from the you know, 1980s. Yeah. It was kind of a flippant remark. Right. Uh, but 
in 2012, it was pretty clear. So by the time they got everything together and they figured, okay, the reality TV star, you know, high social profile, um, seems to have a penchant for uh, folks from Eastern Europe, uh, especially to marry them. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of little things that potentially show that he could um, be sympathetic to them. And they take that sympathy then and the money part. You, know, you mentioned Deutsche mm -hmm. Bank. You're right, Deutsche Bank is a prime vehicle for uh, money laundering to take place and uh, used by Russian oligarchs and others. And the that. information that we've learned uh, is basically that uh, it really stepped up. You know, they maybe didn't think he was going to win the nomination, but that once he won the nomination, that's when the attacks really stepped up. And that even on the day when Donald Trump said, Russia, if you're listening, that's I want you to commit espionage against the United States to help me win the election which is, he, he said it on TV. I mean, this isn't, Absolutely. you know, live. collusion doesn't yeah. have to be secret, folks. It can be open and out loud. Um, it, 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 that's, that's the day they stepped up that's and right. did exactly what well, he asked them to And do. they had done it before, but it wasn't as noticeable. But the fact that they did it right after he made that statement is really a telltale sign that there is something there. And, you know, the Mueller investigation is going to have to find out exactly what that something is. We, we have to take a, one more break. When we come back, Colonel Layton, for the last segment, I'm going to ask you the ultimate question. Do you think Donald Trump is under compromise? Uh, why do you think so? And if so, what should we as Americans do about it? We'll be right back right after this. That's a great question. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> and you'll have about uh, five minutes. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. <laughs> to address all of that. Uh, good. It's, I, 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 I need to have you back. I have other questions about sort of Mueller and... Hey, Mark, do you want me to find Trump talking about asking Russia to hack our yeah, election? Yeah. Do you want me to try to find that? Play that. Um, Give me a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll find it. Just the 15, 20 seconds. We'll, we'll come back in with it. Check. Nice. That'd be nice. Yeah. 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 It's... Um... Yeah, I mean, it's it's just there's so much there that, uh, you know, it's interesting just to see how people react to. Uh, I don't see how people don't see it, frankly, just well, to be honest with you. That's what bothers me. And, and, you know, I'm, you know, I try to be as uh, even handed as possible, mm -hmm. you know, when I make my analyses of different of different things. But but uh, there's some things that you just can't say, you know, I mean, you have to you have to say that this is this I, way. I have to tell you, when he said that in June or July, whatever it was, of 2016, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I came on air and said, that's treason. You can't mm -hmm. ask a foreign power to commit espionage against the United right. States to help your political opponent. I said, remember what Richard Nixon did? They, they, they burglarized the, the Democratic headquarters to steal information on their political opponent to use it against them. Right. In this case, he's asking Russia to do the equivalent of Watergate. That's worse than Watergate. Oh, it's far worse than right, Watergate. Because yeah, Watergate's yeah. a bad thing, and it deserves absolutely. impeachment and removal from office. Absolutely. But asking our enemy to do it, yeah. to me, rises, um, you know, I'm always, um, and this is just for the Facebook audience, but I always keep my constitution with me. And Almost I, a year ago to the day. I got, I got a good clip. All oh. set to okay, go, right. edited, ready to go. Fantastic. Yeah, it's really. Well, what date was it? Uh, July 27th, wow. 2016. So we're, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary. That's That'll be good for the first oh, two years. Yeah. Excuse me, two years. Two, two years. Two two years. Two two year 16, yeah. <laughs> anyway, one of the things I always point out in Article 2, Section 4, is that people always talk about high crimes and misdemeanors. That's not what the clause – that's part of the clause. The right. clause says she'll be convicted, removed from office, shall be, not maybe, shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, yes. bribery, and oh no, or treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. misdemeanors right. So right. Yeah, that's a great point. Treason actually. and bribery are more severe yes. than some high crime and misdemeanor. Treason's number yeah. one. Yeah. And bribery's number two. If he's yeah. being paid by the Russians, that's bribery. Right. And uh, if he's being blackmailed by them to commit espionage, that's treason. High crimes and misdemeanors is is the third option. Mm -hmm. And that was what mm -hmm. was used for Andrew Johnson and 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 Bill Clinton and Richard Nixon. Right. Treason and bribery are number one and two. They're number one and two because you want to protect the sanctity of the republic. You know, and that's... People always tell high crimes misdemeanors. I'm like, no, I mean, maybe, I'm sure he's done that too. That's that's less... That can be... You know, I like, mean, there's a death penalty for treason in absolutely. America. There is, absolutely. So... And it probably wouldn't be invoked. No, but that's, no, I don't think it would be, yeah, but, but... But, you know, if it, assuming it were, it, he were guilty. But the, the problem is, is that there's just so much there. And, you know, any it's call... It's overwhelming. And yeah. we don't even know what... A tenth of what Mueller knows. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, right. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, I'm sure that's absolutely true. 
and you know at the moment that's as it should be eventually we do hope to know, <laughs> you know i more, think but... he'll come out before november 28th before this november do you think so i would hope so i think he's going to yeah. come out yeah. in the fall if i have to predict yeah. i predict september that's my that's a, that's a good time because you've got you know with the election cycle that makes for sense the yeah absolutely. You know, to give the american people a chance to review it and mm-hmm. make a choice based mm-hmm. on it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um and then the, you know the, then of course the, you not know, that robert Mueller calls me and tells me these things no 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 but, you know, we, we have to speculate a little bit sometimes but uh but no i think it's, it's really important that uh you know regardless of one's political views you have to understand that the sanctity of the united states comes first and you know there are times when voices out support coming back guys okay you're going to come back with the clip right yep i got it ready great we stick together, we win. Pick up your number two pencils. It's time for class with Mark Levine. What do I have to get involved with Putin for? I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. He doesn't respect our president. And if it is Russia, which is probably not, nobody knows who it is. But if it is Russia, it's really bad what for a, a different reason. Oh, my God. Because it shows how little respect they have. For our country, when they would hack into a major party and get everything. But it would be interesting to see. I I will tell you this. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. That was almost two years ago today. July 27, 2016, we're coming up on the second anniversary. I hope the media remembers and reminds us. Collusion doesn't have to be in secret behind closed doors. It can be right there in the open. Hey, Russia, if you're listening, please commit espionage against the United States to help me against my political opponent, and you'll be rewarded. Quid pro quo, treason? I mean, you could argue back then it was. Let me ask you the ultimate question I asked before the break. Number one, do you believe that the the Russians are compromising Donald Trump? Do they have secret information on him, financial or otherwise? Do you honestly believe, based on your experience, that's going on? I think it's a distinct possibility. And so it's very important for the sanctity of the Republic of the United States of America that we get to the bottom of what is actually happening here. Uh, and it seems to me, based on you know the statement in, back in 2016, uh, based on what we just heard in these last in this last week or so, uh, there is a real problem here. And the reason I think that is that there are just too many unexplained ends, both of a financial uh, matter and also, frankly, of a political matter uh, that uh, and a personal matter. You and mean, a personal with, with regard to the hotel. Absolutely, and you know, of course, with that as well. And you know, from all of those aspects. I, it's very clear to me that an investigation, uh, you know, must be extremely thorough. Obviously, I mean, Mueller is uh, the primary investigator in this case, and that very fact, uh, you know, that this investigation must continue is, I think, the real, real piece here. But for the the president itself, my suspicion would be that he himself has been compromised. Colonel, if you 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 were in intelligence for twenty six years, if in your twenty fifth year someone came to you with a dossier of a high-level intelligence official, maybe your colleague, maybe your boss, uh, who had this series of circumstances. You know, in the hotel room, you heard allegations of a tape, uh, he won't disclose money. What, what would you do? What would the intelligence do with such a person if they were in the intelligence field? Not President of the United States, just the intelligence field. Any person in that situation, Mark, would be it would basically be removed from their position. They would be placed under investigation. Now, uh, sometimes if you know the investigation is so sensitive and it's still ongoing, uh, you don't remove them right away. Uh, you but want to catch them. In you the want act. to catch them in the act. That's like they did with Robert Hansen, mm-hmm. like they did with Aldrich Ames. Hansen being of the FBI, Ames, of course, of the CIA. I uh, you, you get a warrant to spy on them. Yes, you have to get a warrant to spy on Can them. Can you get a warrant to spy on the president? Uh, that's an interesting legal question. And I, mean, I we think wouldn't know the, about it. It would yeah, be a secret warrant. It would warrant. Be, have to be a secret warrant. It would have to be done uh, very Probable carefully. Probable cause is it, all you need, yeah, under you need the Constitution. Yeah, under the Constitution, that's all you need. So technically, I mean, people would argue that there would be, that the president has special immunities. But I think in this particular case, I have a salute. You know, one idea that I have is that any presidential candidate, 
regardless of party, you know, regardless of any other situation that they're in, even independent candidates, in order to be a candidate for president, they must be clearable for a, a sensitive compartment We're running out of time. We got like 10 seconds left. Bottom line, should President Donald Trump be impeached and convicted and removed from office? Yes. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Cedric Layton, thank you for coming here on the Inside Scoop. I'd love to have you back. We're going to have to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Insanity right. reigns. Hidebound Donald Trump partisans keep insisting.